know uh, what you think. So that means I need my chat up. So, um, all right, can you all see my slides? Okay. Um, all right, now what's gonna happen when I push play is that they, I'm gonna like, it's gonna like disappear. My mouse is gonna disappear at some point. So if you ever see me leave the slides and come back, it's because I'm trying to recover my mouse. So just give, <laughs> giving that heads up also. Um, so I really appreciate being invited. These seminars have been fantastic and I really appreciate the organizers uh, for including me in this series. I'm gonna tell you a very short story about some recent work that was published in PRL um, it, that towards the end of 2019 and we've been working on stuff since then um, and it's on the idea of enzyme driven active matter uh, so let me let me get started so normally if we'd be meeting in person um, we would do a demo like in-person demo but i can't do that so instead i'm going to have you watch this video and this is the demonstration so i want you to pay attention to this so this is a game called keep it up have you ever played keep it up no no, it's where you have a balloon and you, you're trying to make it so it doesn't ever touch the ground. Come on, you're, most of you are physicists, right? Aren't you lonely physicists who played this game? Keep it up. This is, a, this is a game a physicist can play by themselves, right? All right, so, so these children have put a twist on it and they are using pool noodles, which makes it even more exciting because you really it's really a lot harder to. So if we were in person, I would be throwing a bunch of balloons at you and you would be playing keep it up in the room. And what I would be asking you is if you to if you were to track like a single molecule tracking of one of these balloons throughout the room, what would it look like? Would it be, do you think it would look like if we were to track it and just figure out what, what kind of process would it look like, do you think? So go ahead and use the chat um, to tell me what kind of process you it would look like. Again, you're thinking about looking at this from above. We're going to track random diffusion. I'm getting from Nancy. Random walk. Exactly. So the thing is, is that it would look like a random walk, right? So because it looks stochastic, especially his first kid, right? That's like me. That would have been like me. It's just all over the place, right? Um, so it would look random. But here's my question. Is it actually uh, stochastic in the, or, or kind of equilibrium? When we normally think about random walks, right? We think of things that are in equilibrium. But is this process actually in equilibrium? I'm getting some some shaking heads of no, right? So it's not because it the, the kids are applying energy. So a lot of times in physics, we use R as a function of T in order to figure out what the process is doing. And then when we see something random, we say we often equate it to being thermal. We do this in cells a lot. But I, I'm gonna try to pitch you an idea that that's actually not true. Just because something looks random doesn't necessarily mean it's thermal and that we can then use the fact that it's not thermal to get work out. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited about this idea. So if you have a stochastic system, we know you can get work out, right? So just our normal thermal system, if you, if you push down on a piston and lock it into place and then heat it up, then you can get more out of it, right? Because, but you're adding that energy in but it's still an equilibrium process of the right. You can still get this thermal expansion. We can use um, StatMeg to describe this, or just thermodynamics. You don't even need anything fancy, right? So we know that you can get work out of these systems. Um, and then we also often talk about, especially like in sophomore level thermodynamics, we talk about this idea of the Maxwell's demon, right? So how many of you have heard of Maxwell's demon? Raise your hands. Okay, so. Most people have, sometimes when I give this to students, there are professors out there who don't teach about Maxwell's demon, which is, I think, very sad. So, um, so the idea of Maxwell's demon, of course, is if you have a hot box and a cold box, and in between there's a little gap, that if you had a tiny demon that would allow you to open the door every time a hot molecule came from cold to hot, and every time a cold molecule came from, from hot to cold, you could actually make the hot side of the box hotter and the cold side of the box colder. And what we often say in, in physics class in the sophomore level is, ha ha ha, isn't this funny? This doesn't exist, but actually it does exist. And all of you who are out there studying biology know that it exists because you are personally an evidence that it exists because the inside of your body is at a different temperature than the outside of your body. And the only way that's possible is with Maxwell's demons. And you have them all throughout your whole body, right? Because like you have ion channels, like there are some really obvious examples in biology of the Maxwell's demon, right? There are ion channels that will only allow certain ions through and not other ions, like literally can do this process. So biology is all full of Maxwell's demons. And, and it's 
it's great because that's why we're able to like use energy and that's why we're basically meat robots right and then we're we're machines made out of other machines and i'm i'm kind of obsessed about this idea of like how how far down did the turtles go right like so how far down are we machines that we can get work out of right so that's kind of what i've been thinking about lately oh see this is my mouse going crazy all right so um so just as some examples of noisy, random looking processes, but that are actually active. And many of you have seen these in some of these beautiful talks that we've seen. So bacteria swarm on the left-hand side, Janus particles on the right-hand side, both of these are actually, they look random and they're, but they're actually, um, they're actually active. So it turns out like, yes, you, they're actually doing a random walk if you track them, but it turns out the amount that they move before they kind of randomly reorient is fairly large. And so then you get kind of active matter, exciting things that come out of both of these. And both of these systems can be rectified. And so um, that's rectification is a way for us to get work out of a noisy system, right? And the reason why they can be rectified is because the step is very long before they reorient. And so in the, in the case of the bacteria on the left, you can get these kind of you can actually push these into, they'll swim into rotors and then you can create these like large rotors. I don't know, why aren't we doing this? I feel like this is a green technology right here. We could be <laughs> solving many problems. On the right-hand side, these are actually, it's a little bit of a cheat because these are magnetic also. So they do like to stick together. But again, these, these Janus particles will bind together and they'll inform these rotors. Okay, so these are these are all larger length scale. I'm interested in more of the smaller length scale because biology does this, right? So biology, um, all the way down to a single enzyme level, is is active little machines that are able to that are things that could be rectified and probably are rectifying all the way through. So it, within individual cells, or if you look at like this touch me not plant, which actually. Um, has a cascade of um, ion channels opening and closing to cause these leaves to close. So you can create from all the way from the nanoscale, the enzyme level, um, or the ion channel level, all the way up to macro scale, you can get the kind of uh, accumulation of this work and to and actually really get F.DS, like work from these systems, which at their very smallest level are very noisy random systems. Okay. So if we look at, let's go to the gold standard, these Janus particles for active matter, right? So these, these are the, these are kind of the typical for active matter. Many of you have probably seen lots of beautiful talks on these. Um, again, showing you the stuff from, um, from Plashi lab on the left. Um, and then just a close up of a, one of these Janus particles on the right, where they've been kind of uh, half coated with something that can do a chemical reaction and that can cause the propulsion. So some of these will push, some of them will pull. And, um, and in fact, one of the cool things is that you can actually um, use these Janus particles and coat them with enzymes and you can get the same kind of thing happening. So the so we now we realize that right enzymes are performing chemical reactions, much like the chemical reactions which they've painted on with heavy, you know, with metal uh, ions, but now we can actually do this with enzymes. If you can paint half of them, you can get them to propel. And so again, the question is, can we scale this down? How far does this scale down? So if there's a single enzyme, an active matter particle, right? And so now, the, but the scales are very different here. So we're talking about the difference between like a one or a 10 micron bead and then um, versus like a nanoscale object. And if you're interested in these kinds of, uh, in these papers, which are talking about using enzymes to propel, larger scale objects. Um, you should see a lot of the works from this guy, Samuel Sanchez, who's in Spain. He has a lot of really beautiful stuff. He's coated like long cylinders. He's like put them inside of, you know, put the enzymes only decorated the inside of tubes and you can get some really cool stuff. And um, again, all enzyme driven active matter. Now, the problem with this is that um, the, the large Janus particles, right? They have a, they have a fairly slow rot, uh, rotational diffusion and a slow translational diffusion so that when you're able to get them to propel with lots of enzymes, they have a, they have a pretty high Pecolet number, right? So they're mostly kind of moving forward and then very slowly changing their orientation over time, which gives you kind of that more ballistic transport on a longer time scale. Whereas a single enzyme is very small. So it's gonna rotate really quickly and then it's going to, um, you know, it's so when you see it being active, it should look just like diffusion, right? But it should be a faster diffusion if it's getting bigger kicks each time, if it truly is active. 
So this is the question, like, can, can you actually see this? Um, and the other reason why this is very interesting, just from like, not just from a fundamental, like active matter system, but also inside the cell, it's, there's been, um, there's been work that shows that when the inside of a cell is, you know, we know it's very crowded, it's very viscous, it's viscoelastic, and large objects actually have a hard time moving around. And, you know, if you have a large cell, you've gotten, you've got intracellular transport machinery, which is a lot of like kind of some of the stuff that we've studied also over the years with microtubules and kinesin motors and dyning motors. But if you have a smaller cell, even that cell can be hard to move in if you've got a lot of junk in there. So like these bacterial cells being shown in this picture. And so there's an idea out there um, kind of from the uh, Jacobs Wagner lab and um, with some work from Eric Dufresne showing that like, if you can, you know, maybe the enzymes are the, one of their jobs is actually to mix the inside of the cell. So it's like, I think for me personally, I think biology like never lets things go to waste. Like all things seem to do more than one thing. And so if enzyme turnover is also just an, a way to mix the inside of the cell actively, then you can actually get diffusion. These things would still look like diffusion, but the, the propulsion isn't from the thermal, right? Because it's too viscous. The propulsion is actually coming from the enzymes. And so that's another question. Like, can these enzymes just serve as an active bath? And is that biologically relevant and important? So I think those are some other questions, but we, what, this, what I'm gonna show, share with you today is just looking at that kind of single molecule level. Can a single enzyme be an active particle, right? Okay, so I've not, see, okay. I've lost my mouse again, so let me pull out <laughs> and then I'll go back, sorry. Um, and so what I'm showing you here is a cartoon of an enzyme. You know, if you're a, if if you're like biochemist or something, you might say that the what the enzyme uses is called the substrate. What it releases is the product. Enzymes are catalysts; they're unchanged in the reaction. Um, and and so, but I'm just going to use some other words. I'm going to call this the fuel and the exhaust. And and uh, the ones that we're working on are these are in today's talk are these urease enzymes, and their fuel is urea and water, and their exhaust is CO2 and ammonia. This is work that was done by my grad student, Mengzi. She's gonna be graduating this September. She's absolutely fabulous. You've missed the boat. She already has a postdoc. Sorry, folks, I'm, she's taken, but, and she's really fantastic. Um, but so, and I, and I do wanna say, I don't, I know some of you in this crowd. So, and some of you know me, uh, and, and I will just say that basically when I talk about this, uh, the urease is propelled by farts, right? So it's, it farts out CO2 and that makes it go forward. I think farts are funny. So I'm telling you about the farts of this, of this enzyme. Okay. So um, this has actually been seen before, not just for urease, but for also for catalase and for other enzymes. Both of these enzymes in particular are very fast. They turn over very fast and they're exothermic. And what they've seen using fluorescence correlation spectroscopy is that the the diffusion rate goes up as a function of the of the um, of the substrate or what we're calling the fuel. So you add more fuel and you get faster diffusion. Now pay attention to the to the units and the scale on these. They're actually cropped at the bottom, so it looks like the scale is very high, but actually it's it's about a thirty percent, forty percent change in the diffusion coefficient. But you do see an increase um, as a function, and many enzymes have been have been seen. Okay, to, to, to do this now. Now, the problem is, is so um, what this, the process uh, has only been, it was only imaged for a very long time using FCS. It's, it's better now. And our work is one of the first ones that used a different method, but originally it was all done via FCS. And the problem with fluorescence correlation spectroscopy is it's very indirect and you're making a lot of inferences based on the data. So what you're looking at is an individual enzyme and it's wiggling and it will pass through um, the, the beam waste of a laser that's been focused down. And when it, when it fluctuates and rotates through there and diffuses through, you get these fluctuations in the intensity. And then you correlate that and assume that all of those are due to the diffusion. And the problem with that is that there could actually be other processes going on, especially because right, this thing's sitting in water, it could be near a surface, there could be more than one, you could get quenching. So there's this paper. So I, I, if you're interested in this, I encourage you to read this paper as well, um, which came from a group that basically says, look, you can, there's some artifacts in FCS. And so we should be using some different methods for this. And so um, I, I as, as somebody who comes from the single molecule field, 
I, and also somebody who really thinks that seeing is believing, I wanted to actually just look at it directly. So we used a slightly different method, which was to actually use total internal reflection fluorescence microscopy to watch individual enzymes as they diffuse near the surface and then record that diffusion and actually, you know, get R as a function of time for all of these, for the molecules we could see. So just as a reminder, total internal reflection creates an evanescent field of photons. It goes about 200 nanometers from the surface in order to keep the proteins off from sticking to the surface. We've got a we've got pleuronic F127, which is um, um, kind of a block copolymer. It sits on the surface. We're also trying to get these things to stay on the surface more. So we didn't know how to do that. So we started off by just using this methacellulose, which is in here. It's a very large molecule, but it's semi dilute. Um, so it still acts like random coils. It, it, it does seem to help the, the molecules stay close to the surface. And the F127 also seems to help things stay close to the surface. The system we have here slows down the diffusion by a factor of 200, which allows us to make this measurement. So normally these things would that are at this size scale, so we're talking about eight nanometers in, in diameter, would be much too fast for us to visualize with our camera. But by slowing everything down by a factor of 200, we're able to actually see it. All right, so this is some of Mungsi's very first data. The signal to noise on this one isn't great. I'll show you some better stuff later, but because it was one of the first times we were able to track um, and get this uh, information. So you see the raw data on the left, it is a, this one is actually a green uh, protein. It turns out everything in the world is green. So your background is very high in this channel. We switched to a dark red later, which I'll show you in a second, but we can use image J to track R as a function of time. And then we can, Kind of here's the tra trace of this molecule over time. When we use this, uh, we take this trajectory. So every single enzyme that we trace and track, we get a single. Um, we we calculate the mean square displacement for each molecule, and then we can get um, the we can fit that to a line and get a diffusion coefficient for each one. This is quasi two dimensional, but we're using the two dimensional version of the mean square displacement fit. And, um, and we'll pull out a diffusion coefficient for every single molecule. And this is the power of single molecule imaging, which is that you get a distribution. You don't just have to look at um, you know, uh, the, the whole, like the mean or the median of the information, you actually get the distribution of the information. So that's what we're gonna do. So the first time Mungzi did this, this is um, again using, uh, this is now using a dark red. So it's, you can see the signal to noise is a lot better for this one. Um, she the so you can and you what you can see here these are playing back they're not being they weren't recorded at the same time scale and i'll tell you a funny story as to why that was but they're being played back at the same time scale one second per second and you can see with your eyes here that the one on the left without the fuel is diffusing significantly slower than the one on the right with the fuel so we were very excited to see this now why are they where were they recorded at the different time scales the reason is because Mengzi, like a good student, did her control first. So the one on the left was recorded first. When she added the uh, the fuel, the urea, she came she came to see me and she said, I lost the molecules. I was like, what do you mean you lost the molecules? You didn't pipette the molecules in, right? I, she was like, I can't, nope, I, I, they're in there. I put the urea in there. I can't see the molecules anymore. And so we were looking at it and I was like, oh, uh, well, maybe they're just moving faster. So we pumped up the laser power so we could actually see them. We reduced the time scale and they were there they were. So it turned out that like they actually transitioned to not being able to image them uh, while like in, within the same like day, right? So everything was the same. The temperature in the room was the same. All that was the same. And she, we had to actually adjust the uh, imaging parameters in order to see them because they sped up. All right, so with each of these two molecules, just as an example, we can find the mean squared displacement for each. Each one has its own diffusion coefficient. You can see that the slope for the one with the fuel is much higher than the slope without the fuel. And now we can do this for many, many data points. So hundreds of molecules um, in the buffer condition. So no fuel or the with the fuel. And you can see a significant shift of that distribution. And so this is what we're looking for. Um, um, right. And so the, again, the power of single molecule, we have all the molecules uh, recorded and we can see a significant shift in that distribution. Um, for if, ooh, 
went too far, too far again. Uh, we can do we can do controls on this. So we've done catalase, which is another molecule. It's about the same size as the um, the urease, but it doesn't use urea as a as a substrate. We can look at GFP. All of these are slowed down by a factor of two hundred, but the diffusion we measure still scales with size, as you would expect. Um, we also can just check and make sure that urea is in some sort of magical fluid juice. I don't know what it would be, but I, I, has anyone ever heard of something that reduces viscosity like this for one of these of, compared to water? If so, I'd love to try it. Please send me an email. Um, but uh, urea isn't that thing. So um, if you do GFP with and without urea, you can see that um, the diffusion coefficients are the same. I should point out that when we show bar charts, we're showing you the median of that distribution, so the max. Um, we can do this as a function of urea now, and you can see that there is that shift as you change the urea concentration. You can fit this um, to one of these um, hyperbolic functions, which is what you typically get when you, things depend on the concentration that you're adding, like an enzyme. So it does seem like it depends on the amount of the urea that we see. Um, while we were starting to like work on this and present it at March meeting, um, awesome theorists would come up to us and tell us ways that uh, give us predictions, right? So one of those predictions, actually, these, there were a couple of predictions that were published um, that would, because remember, I told you this enzyme is really exothermic. So they said, okay, maybe it's like local heating. And so what, what, would, what we would expect is if you add more and more and more of the enzyme, you'd heat more and then it should go even faster. So we were able to test this, uh, this idea in our system. So our normal single molecule imaging is at 92 picomolar. So it's a very, very low concentration. Um, what we did is we kept the same amount of labeled, but then we added into 40 nanomolar in the background unlabeled. So that should give us, you know, several orders of magnitude. If this really is a temperature, um, you know, due to some collective effect, uh, then we should be able to see that. So this was one of the first things that we, we tested based on the literature. And what we see is that there is actually no effect. So the thing that we're measuring here is actually occurring at the single molecule level. So even if you add, you know, two more orders of magnitude, more of the enzyme in the background, um, that's unlabeled, you still don't see, you don't see it like a, a commensurate increase in the diffusion coefficient here. So whatever this is happening, it's happening at that single molecule range. Another uh, thing that somebody brought up to us is that all of these enzymes that we're looking at are multimers. So you can see that they've got multiple um, monomers stuck together to make these complexes. And so the idea is, well, maybe when it's turning over, it's more labile, right? It's falling apart and coming back together. And when it's falling apart, it's a, it's a smaller molecule, so it should diffuse faster. And so, um, so what we wanted to do is instead see, um, you know, could we just actually measure what the complex was in these different conditions? And so, uh, so this is another thing that's nice about single molecule imaging, which is that you can count things in single molecule imaging. So the way that we did that, again, my thing is not, when it is to, again, it was to use single molecule photo bleaching. So in this case, we soaked, the um, enzyme either in buffer or with the fuel, and then we stuck them to the surface so that they're kind of locked into that, whatever that um, oligomerization state is, and they, they stick to the glass. So we no, we, we no longer have that pleuronic blocking the glass. We purposely want to stick the protein to the glass. Um, and then what we can do is shine the laser light on and look for decreases in the intensity, and that will allow us to count through photo bleaching individual steps. Um, so our intensity, this is a cartoon of our intensity profile. I'll show you real ones in the next slide. But just so you know, so it, it is noisy. It'll bounce up and down. But then you'll see kind of a stark shift. And then it'll be at another plateau. And you can actually figure out where these plateaus are. They're evenly spaced. And then those tell you how many basically fluorescent uh, molecules were in your complex. We did label the enzyme at a one-to-one -one ratio. But, it, you know, as you know, it's on average. So some will have one, some will have zero. Uh, some might have two, so it, but it's the, the average was one to one. And you can see, we can see examples of one step, two steps, three steps, in fact, all the way out to six steps, um, which is interesting because that's actually what this is. Uh, so it's expected that the urease is a hexamer. And so we can see six, but actually we don't typically see six. We often see two or three. And now again, comparing the distributions between when you have the buffer present and you don't, we don't see a huge shift in that distribution. In fact, we don't see any shift at all. And so whether you soak this enzyme with its fuel or not, the complex is always about the same dimers and trimers. 
All right, so I will, the, I think I'm over time, so I'll, <laughs> I'll finish here. Um, so just as a reminder, single enzymes seem to be able to diffuse faster. This has now been shown by multiple groups with multiple uh, methods. So it does seem like, especially for your urease, this is something that's really happening. Um, and you can actually even hook them onto larger objects and cause those objects to propel. The diffusion rate does depend on the enzyme fuel concentration. It's, uh, the diffusion is independent of the enzyme concentration. So this is really happening on the single enzyme level. And this um, fuel doesn't seem to affect the oligomerization state. And again, this was published in PRL back in 2019. Since then, we've been working on um, new stuff there because there are so many open questions out there, right? How does the enzyme doing this? Right? <laughs> is it really doing these extra kicks, right? Basically, is it farting out and making itself move faster? But another thing is, you know, can we design, have designer shuttles where can, that can be propelled by this enzyme? So again, some is similar to the stuff that Sam Sanchez is working on, but we want to try to shrink that down. And then of course, this third question is like, does this actually apply to biology, right? Is this a part of physics that we can actually apply to biology? This is the, some of the non-equilibrium nature of biological systems. And is this being used to mix as an active bath inside of living cells? Um, to answer some of these questions, I've teamed up with, um, with uh, uh, Ben Rogers and uh, Wiley Ahmed, and we're probing these things. So with Ben, we're working on creating designer active matter using DNA origami to allow us to specifically attach the enzymes to certain locations. We're currently on our second DNA origami design. We can get DNA origami to fold and bind enzyme. It's just not binding as much as we want. So we have to update our designs. Um, and then Wiley does very sensitive um, measurements with his optical trap to measure um, equal, like dis, uh, deviations from equilibrium. So we're gonna be combining all of this together to try to address some of these big questions. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for listening. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, this is the Ross Lab part of actually most of the Ross Lab this summer. We've been able to come back full steam. Um, so I'm really, really excited. Um, I realize that we are down on white men. If you're a white man and you'd like to apply to my laboratory, we have none. Uh, apparently. So uh, I didn't even realize that until I was looking at this picture. So please feel free to apply. We are taking grad students and undergrads at all times. So um, all right, that's all I've got. Okay, Jenny, thanks for the fantastic work. Um, so there are a lot of questions. Let me see, probably we have we can only pick a few of them. Um, and we can leave uh, uh, for, uh, for the later discussion. Um, Rubin Brusma asks you, if you introduce effective temperature for diffusion, does the chemical reaction being catalyzed proceed with the effective temperature? Uh, what does that mean to introduce effective temperature? Oh, um, uh, hi, Jennifer. Um, if you say that the, diffu that the diffusion coefficient is faster when it is active, then you can say, well, that is like ordinary diffusion, but you have a little higher temperature for the larger diffusion coefficient. Does that effective temperature then also regulate the other functions of the enzyme? I, you know what? I don't know. I'm not sure I... Um... You mean like would that temperature then lift the the reaction rate and also cause the reaction rate like a feedback loop? That's right. Um, Why not? I, I I think it could. I mean that's one of the issues, right? Like so we actually did on in this uh, PRL some back of the envelope easy experimental uh, list version of theory where we tried to figure out like how much temperature would increase in our system and it really should be dissipating immediately but there's some idea that maybe there could be this local temperature gradient and yeah that maybe that does have a feedback loop on urease it's a very very fast enzyme we're talking like thousands of times a second that it's turning over its substrate thank you yeah so uh there's one uh rough bunch Ask, can you look at less active mutant and see how the change in diffusion constant depends on enzyme activity? Actually, I have this another question, similar really questions. You know, Sunny Xi has worked to show uh, single multi enzymology, right? The enzyme can show uh, different fluctuating enzyme activity. I want to see if you, you know, you, you will observe that reflect in your, your experiments. I, I think you. I think the distribution we're getting is from from the differences, right, within the enzyme. Maybe even within the same enzyme at different times. Um, as far as mutants, we haven't used that because we're actually buying this enzyme <laughs> from a company, and um, and so we we are not. Even though we have the ability usually to purify stuff, in this case, the enzymes are available commercially. 
And so we're using them. Although I will warn people, if you're interested in this, we do seem to, there's like bad batch to batch variation. So we've had whole tubes that don't work. And so we may be forced to be purifying it ourselves. Probably we will end up doing that or with other enzymes. Um, and then that would allow us to actually do the mutations that you're talking about. What we did do both in this paper and other people have done is there are known inhibitors. And when you add the inhibitor, you can block the activity. So you can add the high amount of um, urea and then, but with inhibitor, and then you don't see the increase. So we, so it's not really the same thing. The other thing I think would be cool is to try to run it backwards. Some enzymes you can run backwards to see if you still get enhanced diffusion when you're running an enzyme in the opposite direction. Okay, Pablo, I'll just pick one more question. There's a, a from Anusha. Is it known? Is it known if the interaction with urea causes conformational change in the protein? Could it be making it effective smaller? Yeah, that's actually something we don't know. It would that would involve us. I mean, in fact, uh, were you our reviewer? One of our reviewers brought this up. So it's very possible, right, that instead of just falling apart, it's doing this or something, right? It's becoming a different shape which would then uh, alter its diffusion coefficient. Cause as you know, it's the cross section of the molecule. So we keep showing them like they're these little triangular, you know, systems, but if the triangle was somehow able to, to flop open like this and become linear, that would also increase the diffusion coefficient that we observe. Um, we can't test that. You could test that with FRET. Um, and again, I think that would also include the mean that we would need to, instead of just randomly labeling, we would probably need to uh, dial in where those labels are so that we could test those conformational changes. But like many enzymes, yes, I, there's, I, urease does do conformational changes as it's going. The question is how big are those conformational changes? And could that be enough to change your diffusion coefficient? Okay.